Medtronic Technologies impacted more than 72 million people in the last year, equating to two people every second. Harnessing the power of technology to take healthcare further, each technology has unique benefits designed to serve patients. The goal of this program is to get closer to the patient and delve into the challenges and impact of each technology in practice. This is the Medtronic MedEd learning experience. The Nelcor pulse oximetry monitoring system should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or therapy and is intended only as an adjunct in patient assessment. Medtronic's medical education programs are offered to provide attendees education on the FDA cleared indications and use of our products when applicable. The contents and conclusions of the following program are solely those of the speakers unless otherwise cited. The speakers are responsible for all content and any necessary permissions. The speakers receive funding from Covidian LP, a Medtronic company, for this speaking engagement. For this introduction segment of the series, a discussion on the Nelcor technology. We will discuss the clinical fundamentals of pulse oximetry technology. To help provide insight into the topic is John Gallagher, professor of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Before we discuss pulse oximetry in detail, I want to take a few minutes to discuss key terms related to the types of hemoglobin, as well as the way oxygen saturation is measured. There are two clinical categories related to hemoglobin, functional hemoglobin and dysfunctional hemoglobin. Functional hemoglobin are hemoglobin molecules that can reversibly bind to oxygen, whereas dysfunctional hemoglobin are hemoglobin molecules that cannot reversibly bind to oxygen. An example of this would be carboxyhemoglobin, or hemoglobin bound to carbon monoxide. Functional oxygen saturation is the percentage of functional hemoglobin bound with oxygen, as measured by pulse oximetry, whereas fractional oxyhemoglobin content is the percentage of hemoglobin bound with oxygen relative to the amount of both functional and dysfunctional hemoglobin. This is measured by a cooximeter. Calculated oxygen saturation is determined by an arterial blood gas machine, and it's based on the measured partial pressure of arterial oxygen, the blood pH, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood, as well as temperature and the normal O2 dissociation curve. Pulse oximetry measures the percentage of functional hemoglobin bound with oxygen. 98 to 99% of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin as measured by the SAO2, whereas only 1 to 2% of oxygen is circulating in the plasma as measured by the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. The SpO2 is calculated by dividing oxygenated hemoglobin by the sum of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. The basic principle for which pulse oximetry operates is based on the Beer-Lambert law. The Beer-Lambert law states that there's a linear relationship between the concentration and absorbance of the solution, meaning that as light passes through a solution, the particles or solute within that solution will absorb light of different wavelengths. With pulse oximetry, these chromophores are oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, and each absorbs light in different concentrations depending on the spectrum, whether that be red or infrared light. It's the Beer-Lambert law principle that is responsible for our ability to measure not only the pulse waveform and pulse oximetry, but also the saturation of oxygen within the device. There are three fundamentals of pulse oximetry which we'll discuss in detail as we move through the program. The first is that arterial blood volume changes during the cardiac cycle result in a periodic variation in the LED light absorption. The pulse oximeter must recognize pulsatile flow or it's unable to measure oxygen saturation. Oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin absorb light differently with red and infrared LED light. Pulse oximeters must read the relative absorption waves of both red and infrared light to know the amount of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. Finally, the arterial peak absorbance of red and infrared light is plotted along a calibration curve to report a corresponding SpO2. Pulse oximeters must have specifically matched calibration curves to the LED lights in the sensor to get an accurate translation from LED light absorbance to SpO2. This diagram illustrates the basic function of a transmittance pulse ox sensor, 
with two wavelengths of light, red and infrared, passing through the tissue bed to be detected by the photodetector on the other side. Through the sensor is the pulsation of arterial blood, which expands and contracts with each pulsation, allowing the sensor to detect the change in light absorption and calculating then the plasmography or pulse waveform. Deoxygenated hemoglobin preferentially absorbs red light, while oxygenated hemoglobin or oxyhemoglobin preferentially absorbs infrared light. And from this is calculated the oxygen saturation. We can see in more detail here how oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin absorb light differently in the visible and near infrared spectral regions. On the left of the diagram is the spectrum of red LED light. And we can see that that light is preferentially absorbed by deoxygenated hemoglobin represented by the blue line. On the right side, we see the infrared LED spectrum, which is preferentially absorbed by oxygenated hemoglobin, which is represented by the red line. Pulse oximetry measures the pulse or plethmography wave as arterial blood content changes during the cardiac cycle, resulting in periodic variations in light absorption. During systole, as the vessel expands, maximum light loss or absorption occurs, whereas during diastole, as the vessel contracts, minimum light loss or absorption occurs. There are constants within this formula for venous blood, bone, tendon, water, and fat, as well as sensor light coupling. These do not change during the normal cardiac cycle, but we will talk about some limitations that can impact this a little bit later. Accuracy of a pulse oximeter is determined by comparing the oxygen saturation measured by the pulse oximeter to arterial oxygen saturation measured directly by a co-oximeter. The FDA device accuracy standards require that accuracy between the measured SpO2 pulse oximetry values and the reference SaO2 co-oximeter values be measured and accurate between the ranges of 70 to 100 percent and within the sub-ranges of 70 to 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent, and 90 to 100 percent. The method used to determine accuracy is the accuracy root mean square error or ARMS. ARMS approximates the mean absolute deviation between SpO2 and SaO2. The difference between a direct measured saturation and that measured by the pulse oximeter must be less than or equal to 3% for transmittance, wrap and clip style, and less than or equal to 3.5% for ear clip and reflectance sensors. The FDA classifies prescription use pulse oximeters as a class two device with moderate risk. The recommendations for testing of these devices in development requires that testing should be conducted on 10 or more healthy subjects in varying age and gender, yielding a data set of 200 or more data points. Those subjects should have a range of skin pigmentation, at least two that are darkly pigmented in the group of 10, or if the sample size is larger, 15% of the subject pool. We must also provide data on agreement between the method of measurement, the difference between SpO2 and SaO2 within those subjects and all subjects that are pooled. There are a variety of pulse oximetry sensors, but most fall into the two categories of either a transmission sensor or a reflectance sensor. Transmission sensors are the most common type of oxygen sensor where the LED light transmits through the tissue bed to a photodetector on the other side. The best example of this is a finger clip or finger wrap type sensor. Reflectance sensors, the LED and photodetector sit side by side, and the LED transmits light down into the perfused tissue, and then it comes around and is detected by the photodetector. The reflectance sensor is illustrated here and the most common type is that used on the forehead over the supraorbital artery. It's important that the correct pulse oximeter sensor be used for the, each type of patient, meaning adult patients should have adult sensors, pediatric patients have pediatric sensors, that the location of the sensor be appropriate for the type of probe used, and that the probe properly fit, have good form, and be at the proper tightness in order to function properly.
There are a number of sensor application and patient conditions that can impact accuracy of the pulse oximeter. Two of the most common are poor peripheral perfusion as well as motion. While modern pulse oximeters have algorithms to mitigate these issues within reason, poor peripheral perfusion can result in a decrease in the pulse plasmography waveform and the ability to properly detect oxygen saturation. Excessive motion can also interfere with the readings of the pulse oximeter as well. When we look at peripheral perfusion as well as motion, it might be important to consider using a different location other than the digit or ears or areas where low perfusion may be to a sensor that measures the supraorbital artery, such as a reflectance sensor, which may be more accurate in low perfusion conditions. Venous pulsation, while normally not occurring, can occur in situations such as trigospid regurgitation, patients that are on continuous renal replacement therapy, and even if a sensor is taped too tight where venous pulsation can occur and confound the arterial pulsation, creating an artificially low oxygen saturation reading. Dark skin pigmentation, because of melanin, which readily absorbs the infrared and red light, may overestimate the oxygen saturation of patients with darker skin. Certain intervascular dyes that are injected as part of diagnostic procedures, such as methylene blue, can also create errors within oxygen saturation measurements, as well as externally applied coloring agents or nail polish, especially of the darker variety. Dysfunctional hemoglobins, as mentioned earlier, are those type of hemoglobins where the pulse oximeter may become confused with saturation of oxygen with hemoglobin versus saturation of hemoglobin with carbon monoxide. So carboxyhemoglobin can create a falsely elevated oxygen saturation relative to the actual oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin. And it is only in measuring on a cooximeter that we can truly know if the oxygen saturation is accurate. While anemia does not impact the saturation function of the pulse oximeter, the fact that the hemoglobin is low, even though well saturated, does impact the oxygen delivery to the tissues. Ambient light, many of sensors are very well shielded. However, we can see in the middle picture that the sensor, a finger probe on the ear, is peeling back and that ambient light can get in and confound the measurement of the sensor. Additionally, the patient has a lot of edema which does not allow for good transmittance of the light to the photodetector. Two of the last things that we want to talk about are off-label or improper sense, sensor selection or use on the patient in the improper location. And we'll show a couple examples of that. The last picture, we see a finger probe placed on the patient's forehead. This is a transmission sensor being reviewed, used as a reflectance sensor and can provide inaccuracies. Often when a sensor is used in this way, it will show an artificially high oxygen saturation reading, which may become problematic as the patient desaturates, but the measured saturation with this probe does not reflect that change in saturation. Incorrect sensor selection and placement has significant patient safety implications. Often the use of a finger sensor on the ear or forehead can result in erroneously high or overestimation of oxygen saturation, especially in the face of desaturation. So it's important to use the right sensor for the right patient in the right location. In this picture, we see two sensors. The first, a reflectance sensor on the forehead, as properly indicated, is showing a measured oxygen saturation of 97%, while a finger wrap sensor placed on the ear for which it was not designed is showing a saturation measurement of 100%. This difference of 3% and in the range of oxygen saturation that we see may not be clinically relevant. However, in the case where the patient is desaturating, the improperly placed sensor may overestimate the actual saturation and may become clinically relevant at true lower saturations in the patient. We must remember that the pulse oximeter is an adjunctive tool that supports our clinical decision making, but is no way a substitute for assessment and clinical judgment, and that we need to use the pulse oximetry reading in addition to other assessment data 
that may reflect the patient's hypoxemia. Some of the clinical findings which we may see, such as change in mentation, respiratory rate, the way of tachypnea, change in skin color, dyspnea, and chest pain may point us in a direction contrary to what the pulse oximeter is telling us. Patients that are tachypnic in the face of a good oxygen saturation may be a reflection that the patient is able to compensate adequately with an increase in minute ventilation, but this will only be for a little bit of time. Additionally, if the patient happens to be on supplemental oxygen, that may decrease the responsiveness of the pulse oximeter in the face of those other findings. So we need to consider our whole clinical picture and when possible, getting an arterial blood gas to provide additional information may be useful. As we conclude this session, I leave you with a few things to remember. Pulse oximetry provides a non-invasive trended assessment of oxygen saturation, but it's not the gold standard and is not a replacement for clinical judgment. It requires an adequate pulse signal in order to provide an accurate oxygen saturation. And when this pulse signal is compromised, it's important that we troubleshoot as to why and consider alternate location or perhaps an alternate sensor to be used in an area where perfusion is more optimal. Modern pulse oximetry systems can reasonably accommodate for patient factors such as this low perfusion and motion, but it's important to refer to the instructions for use to know what factors impact accuracy. Finally, Supplemental oxygen increases alveolar and arterial oxygen concentration and may decrease the responsiveness of pulse oximetry to detect hypoxemia, hypoventilation, and apnea. Please tune in next week for a new segment from this series wherever you find your podcasts. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. Thank you for listening.